Spinal stenosis is a confusing topic, but I want to tell you exactly what it means, as well as the technologies we use these days to both diagnose it and to treat it non-operatively as well as operatively. First, let's go over some definitions so we all understand what spinal stenosis means. In regards to the spine, there's the cervical spine, which is the neck. You have the thoracic spine, which is the next 12 bones, the neck being seven bones. The next 12 bones is the thoracic spine. And then the lumbar spine is lumbar one, two, three, four, five. Between each of these bones is a disc. It's like the cushioning in the spine. On the back part of the spine, you have a facet, a left facet and a right facet. These are similar to the joints in your fingers, your wrist joint, hip joint, elbow joint. So there's kind of three areas that move in the spine. It's bone, disc bone, and in the back are the joints. So the mobile parts of the spine, or the parts that can wear out, is the disc space, the joint on the left side, and the joint on the right side. If you look down the tunnel of the spine, so looking down the tunnel of the spine, is the column where all the nerves run down. In the neck, this is where the spinal cord is. In the mid-back, your spinal cord is there. But then at either thoracic 12 or lumbar 1, it's actually a sac filled with a bunch of nerves running down, and that's your lower back. In either case, when there's compression of those nerves, compression of the spinal cord in the neck, in the back, or in the lower part of the back around the thing called the fecal sac, anytime there's compression squeezing those nerves, that creates stenosis. If it's in your spine, then it's spinal stenosis. So again, if this is your spine, looking down the tunnel of the spine, anything that starts squeezing this area here creates a diagnosis of spinal stenosis. There's a lot of reasons that area can get squeezed. Most commonly, it's arthritis and wear and tear. Just like you get a callus formation on your hand, you get thickening of the tissues in the back part of the spine, thickening of the joints in the back part of the spine, that rubbing, that wearing and tear, that wear and tear is kind of like your body trying to fuse itself together or add extra protection, just like on your hands, and that starts squeezing the nerves. That develops very slowly. That develops over months to years, and it starts squeezing the spine, and that's usually okay. When it's not okay, is when it starts causing pain. It could cause back pain, but in general, what it starts to cause is shooting down pain, pain going into the butt, going into the side of the thigh, front of the thigh, down the leg, shooting all the way down. That could be either from a disc herniation that pushes up and starts squeezing those nerves. It could be from a bone spur that just kept growing and growing, and now it's just squeezing that nerve. Another thing that could be caused is a term called anterolisthesis. It's a fancy medical word for when you have so much arthritis in the back, or if you have a small fracture in the back part of your spine from wear and tear, your bones slip forward. And this instability, this one bone slipping forward on the other, starts to wear out the disc space, pinch, squeeze the nerve. That's spinal stenosis. Well, in terms of the imaging we use, there's four ways to diagnose spinal stenosis. The first would be an x-ray. This could be a straight on view, side view, bending view, and extending back view. That helps assess the stability of the bones, the movement of the bones, as well as gives you a very realistic view of the disc space and how much disc height is left between each bone. The next imaging modality I would use to diagnose spinal stenosis would typically be an MRI. An MRI is where you have to get in that smaller tube and it spins around and it helps see the nerves, the tissue, the um, water content, the fluid. The MRI would be critical to diagnose spinal stenosis. It helps see the tissue, the fluid, the muscle, the nerves, kind of anything that's soft tissue around the nerves and the spine. That's the gold standard to diagnose spinal stenosis. Sometimes people can have an MRI. Another study you could get is something called a CT myelogram. What a CT myelogram is, is it's like a CT scan, so the wider open tubes that don't use the magnets. Um, but the thing you have to have is something called an injection, 
of, of, of a dye in and around the spinal column. So an anesthesiologist or someone that's trained to do that will put a dye into that area around the spine, and then you get this special CT scan and that helps you see where the dye goes and how much compression of the dye there is. Third thing or fourth thing you could do would just be a CT scan. Now a CT scan is great, very helpful, but it doesn't show the nerves that well. It just shows the bone structure or the calcification in the spine. So it doesn't necessarily show you the soft tissue, but it could show you the calcification of the soft tissue. I frequently get a CT scan if I'm trying to diagnose a condition called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. If I'm trying to evaluate fractures a little better, if there's revision, if I'm trying to see what another spine surgeon did before, a CT scan's helpful. It also helps me see um, the quality of the disc sometimes, as well as the quality of the facets or the joints in the back of the spine. But the key things are usually an MRI and an X-ray would be, would be the first things to really diagnose spinal stenosis. Some of the newer technologies coming out is there's much higher quality MRIs that are out there. You'd have to kind of call around to different facilities to see which one has the highest quality MRI machine. But people that usually are afraid of MRIs and get a open air MRI or a big tube MRI, those are actually a lot lower quality and they don't show the arthritis and the inflammation in the spine as much as some of the newer technology MRIs that give you a very, very, very high definition. It'd be like watching a sports game on a TV in the 90s over basic cable versus watching something on a 4K TV, which is now almost already outdated um, in 2023. So there's just a different qualities of MRI, and I just really encourage patients to seek out the highest quality MRI machine. The next way, now that you have the diagnosis of spinal stenosis, and again, it's not just a radiographic diagnosis, it's a clinical diagnosis. The clinician needs to examine you. They need to hear your history. That's really important to diagnosing spinal stenosis as well and the symptoms of spinal stenosis, that's critical. Once that's confirmed, the next things are the non-surgical treatment and the surgical treatment. Well, I have many other videos that detail the non-surgical treatment of spinal stenosis. Going forward for this particular video, I'm just gonna talk about the newer technologies and some of the more advanced technologies we use to help treat spinal stenosis. The first thing I need to say is, there's not a one type of surgery that fixes all of it. There's, in general, a few different types of surgeries out there. You have something called laminectomies or decompressions, which are, in short, shaving off the bone spurs in the back. No screws, no rods. And then you have fusion surgeries. Those are where you use these pedicle screws. You'll use cages, kind of like this. This is an A-lift cage that go into the disc space. And you also have disc replacements. This is a disc replacement right here. And a disc replacement addresses the pathology in the front part. It does not address the joints or the facets in the back. Determining which type of surgery you need is first of all, surgeon dependent. It's also based on their training, their experience, and most importantly, it's based on your x-rays and your advanced imaging, such as your CT or your MRI. It's also based on your examination and your history. Some of the newer technologies we use are the following. The one that I'm really excited about is the ultrasonic technology. I like using ultrasonic technology because it's a way that you can use a something called a bone scalpel to shave off tight pathology in the spine for much smaller incisions. And the key thing about smaller incisions is faster recovery, less narcotics, and it's less disruption of the normal tissue in the back. So using this thing called like an ultrasonic knife in a way, it's a knife that goes in there and it doesn't cut tissue, it doesn't cut nerves, but it oscillates at such a high frequency, it matches the bone and it cuts the bone. It also can melt away the arthritis and melt away the bone when it's pushed back and forth at a high speed next to the bone. So I like using ultrasonic technology. It's one of the newer forms of technology that more and more surgeons are uh, getting accustomed to and that they're incorporating in their own practice. Don't use it in every case, but there are certain times when that advanced technology is very helpful for this specific patient. Another form of technology I'm very excited about is navigation. It's a way where the spine surgeon can use the screens in the room and they can tell them exactly where that screw is going to in the bone. This can be done using something called an O-arm that does a CT spin of the patient. There's other non-CT ways you can line up the patient's anatomy 
You can even use MRI machines now, or preoperative MRI machines now, that will kind of help navigate if you sync that with the fluoroscopy. It's a little too complicated for this talk here, but there's just newer technology that you can um, provide the patient to navigate your pedicle screws that increases the efficiency as well as the accuracy of screw placement. You could also navigate different things such as your cage going in. So when the cage goes in, you can use navigation to make sure it's in the perfect spot. And you can use the preoperative planning of the navigation to make sure you're using the cage with the right height, with the right contour, something called lordosis. That's a very important part. Something called sagittal restoration. That pretty much if um, your spine is collapsing forward, using cages with lordosis that curves it back is a very important part in modern day spine surgery. Understanding pelvic parameters, essentially where your hip and where your sacrum is in a line with each other. If it's far back, if it's big slope, if it's not a big slope, different movements of the spine in relation to your hip joints is just a whole philosophy. Spine surgeons really didn't appreciate 10 years ago that now we live and die by today in this current year. Another thing I really like about technology is the 3D printed technology. Having cages that are customized for the patient that give them the exact slope that they need is important. Also, we used to use cages called PEAK and they were essentially just plastic, medical form of plastic placed in the disc space. While those were okay at the time, we now have better structured PEAK. We have PEAK that's plasma coated with titanium that allows for bone growth, that stimulates the bone to grow into that cage. I think um, cages that have osteogenic and osteoconductive properties are very exciting. They stimulate the bone to grow into that cage and that helps the patient heal, that promotes fusion, that promotes better quality of life and decreases the rate of non-unions. Another piece of technology that is very exciting are disc replacements. This is one type of disc replacement, it's one that's very common. And the good thing about disc replacements are that they're able to help with degenerative disc disease or disc herniations if certain parameters are met. In general, those parameters are the following. You can't have any instability of the spine. You shouldn't have complete disc height collapse because that implies severe joint arthritis. And you can't have severe joint arthritis. The disc replacement only fixes this front part of the spine. It doesn't do anything to the back part of the spine. So if there's severe arthritis in the back, the disc replacement's not gonna fix that. This is a giant model of a disc replacement. And you can see it's a motion sparing device that allows for 360 degrees of motion. They're a great form of technology. In a way, they've actually been around since the early 2000s, but the newer, um, the newer models out there are becoming even more advanced than the previous models. And they're just a growing piece of technology that I'm very excited about. There's many, many, many spine surgeons that are extremely comfortable doing cervical disc replacements. The field of lumbar disc replacements is one that is still growing and one that is still being perfected. Another piece of technology that's exciting are O-lift cages and lateral cages. We're doing more and more surgeries instead of going through the belly, we're going through the back, we're actually going under the ribs through the side of the patient. And the reason that's better is because there's less soft tissue disruption and you're able to get in these big cages with the big mesh footprints to cover a much wider surface area in the spine. This gives the patient more height and more improvement of alignment and more improvement of fusion capabilities. The nice part about going through the side is that it decreases some of the risk. It also decreases sometimes the need for an exposure surgeon or vascular surgeon, but that's surgeon dependent. It's also regional dependent. It's also dependent on the patient's anatomy. So that's another great advantage of the lateral approach. It's just another great way spine surgeons can do surgery without having to only go through the back. The disadvantage with going through the back is that you can only use a certain size cage. There's smaller cages. It could be the size of the top part of my pinky, whereas something where you go through the front is an A-lift cage. You get a much bigger correction with much bigger cages there. Um, you can still achieve a great amount from the back, but having the ability and just the option to go through the front or go through the side is very advantageous. And it's another piece of technology that spine surgeons are utilizing more and more. So in general, there's newer technologies every single year that come out to help us diagnose spinal stenosis and treat spinal stenosis. I like technology and I like the newer innovation because they help us achieve smaller incisions. They help us achieve faster recovery. And they're one of the many things I incorporate into my practice, both diagnostically as well as from a treatment modality. I try to offer it to all of my patients whenever it's applicable.